talk more about what happened in Westminster this week, I'm joined now by Michael Patillo, the former Conservative MP and broadcaster who himself ran for the Tory leadership in 2001. Michael, thank you for joining us this week on Spectator TV. Um, as, as we speak to one another, uh, we're hearing the drip drip of no confidence letters slowly trickling in a, a handful this week. Is the situation terminal for Boris Johnson? No, I don't, don't think it is. I think his position has probably improved quite a lot over the last few weeks. Um, a combination of circumstances, the opposition to him in the Conservative Party is disorganised and divided. I think some of them have been quite spooked by some of the tactics of the whips and some of the things that have been uh, written about them. Uh, I think he was uh, very much helped by the defection of a Tory to the Labour benches. I think he was helped by what David Davis said a couple of weeks ago in the House of Commons because David Davis managed to get the tone of it uh, wrong. But I suppose most of all he's been helped by the fact that the Sue Gray report is coming out in drips. And so it's very difficult for a Tory MP who wants to make a decision about whether to get rid of Boris Johnson or not to know quite what, when that moment is, because there's a sense that we ought to wait until the whole process is completed. Well, that may now be weeks or I think more probably months. And there's always the feeling that not all the information is there yet. And in the interval, the alternatives have been on display. Rishi Sunak, Liz Truss, I dare say, a few others. Uh, and I've not been overly impressed by them in the last few weeks. I dare say Tory MPs haven't been either. So remember, they're not just deciding whether they want to get rid of Boris Johnson. They're having to think about who might be a better replacement after the long and bruising business of choosing uh, a new leader because if Boris goes there'll be a lengthy leadership election because the Conservative Party procedures uh, are really not designed for a Conservative Party in office or, although they've now been used repeatedly when the Conservative Party is in office but they're inappropriate for it. So one way or another I'm not saying that Boris will survive but I think his chances of survival are pretty good and I think they're a good deal better than they were. And one of the things that's been dominating the conversation in Westminster in recent weeks, other than cake, uh, is confidence votes. It's yet to happen, but as you, as you mentioned, um, we're in a situation where no one's really organising the letters, it feels it's dripping, it's various parts of the party, so it's very hard to predict. But if we end up in a situation where 54 letters go in and there is a confidence vote, do you therefore think Boris Johnson is actually quite a strong position to win that vote? Or could a secret ballot come back to bite him? Well, I'm not in the House of Commons anymore. I'm distant from it. And uh, you can only know that if you're in the House of Commons. And indeed, even if you're in the House of Commons, you can't know that because you can't know everybody's mind. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you don't know what can be the impact of um, a, a brief election campaign around the vote of no confidence. You know, I think Boris would get in touch with a lot of members of Parliament. He would use his uh, famous charm. So there are all sorts of unpredictable things. But with all those caveats, I would have said, yes, he has a pretty good chance of surviving the confidence vote. Um, if Theresa May survived the confidence vote, I think Boris has a pretty good chance. Um, although things have moved on a lot since the last election, there must be some Conservative MPs who remember that they won the last election with Brexit and with Boris. Now, Brexit will not be an issue in the next election, or certainly not in the way it was at the last one. And they, they have to ask themselves, can they win next time without either Brexit or Boris? Now, you encouraged Margaret Thatcher not to resign. Um, and I wondered uh, if you were uh, speaking to Boris Johnson now, it's perhaps it's what you were just saying there about um, what MPs could be thinking or maybe should consider. What do you think Boris Johnson should be saying to his MPs to make them focus their minds? Well, the most important thing is to say something to them. And I mean on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, the reason I urged Margaret Thatcher not to resign after all the members of her cabinet had urged her to quit was that in the brief um, leadership election campaign, she had not canvassed a single member of parliament. She hadn't asked a single one of them to vote for her. The campaign was handled by others or rather mishandled by others. And so my point to her was that she was still in the race at that stage. And I thought that if she canvassed hard, 
she could still um, hold on. Now, I don't think Boris needs this bit of advice because he's rather good at uh, canvassing people. But the second uh, bit of advice, ap apart from talking to people, that I would offer him is something that I gained from Michael Heseltine. And Heseltine's principle was that, that no member of parliament was a lost cause, was a hopeless case. So even if you know that somebody has opposed you for decades, that's no reason why you shouldn't go and canvass them because you don't know whether that person will calculate that uh, keeping you, Boris, is a better bet to, than the alternative. Um, <laughs> as an example of this, in a way, uh, I probably spent 20 or 25 years uh, hoping and even mildly campaigning th that Boris should not become the leader of the Conservative Party. And here I am now rather believing that if I was still a Conservative Member of Parliament, I'd probably want to retain him rather than lose him at the moment. Um, now, you're a low-tax Tory, and one of the things which has been uh, interesting to follow in the past week or so is Boris Johnson had lots of meetings with his MPs, doing some of the things that you, you've just been talking about, you know, uh, telling them why uh, they should stick with him, and repeatedly the national insurance hike has come up. Um, many MPs, as I think tends to happen in a Boris Johnson meeting, left with a distinct sense that the Prime Minister agreed with them and was going to ditch it. But we heard over the weekend from Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson that the national insurance rise is going ahead. How much of a problem uh, do you think is that for Boris Johnson's position if Tories ultimately feel that he is not uh, as leading the Conservative government they want to see and perhaps in the next election is going to have to talk about more big state conservatism than what they would want to? Well, I think they're going to be very unhappy that uh, national insurance is going up. Um, some of them, a few brave souls, actually voted against it. And the reason they voted against it was not just they didn't want tax rises, but in particular they didn't want that tax rise. They didn't want a tax that fell on uh, working people quite heavily, uh, and they didn't want a tax that fell on jobs quite heavily. Uh, and uh, on employers, and that could have an effect on putting up prices. And the combination of all that with the other things that are going to happen, the general uh, inflationary position and the energy prices, it's, it's a serious situation. And um, members of parliament are very worried that they're going to lose um, heaps of votes uh, about all of this. The, um, the comparison with Margaret Thatcher is quite interesting because she probably for a while at least, uh, talked a better game than the one that she played. I mean, I was just checking this today. You know, the rate of income tax, the top rate, was 60% until 1988. That is to say that she'd been in office for nine years with a top rate of tax of 60%. Top rate of tax today, I believe, is 45%. So, uh, uh, of course, it depends what you're measuring. And I believe that it is true that the tax burden is now at its highest for 70 years. So this is displeasing to Tories. On the other hand, if you're going to make historic comparisons, it's probably best to you know, make them quite accurate. And to me, I mean, it is extraordinary to recall that we were there nine years in government with a top rate of tax of 60%. So perhaps um, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak have a point when they say they are Thatcherites still. Um... <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think they are Thatcherites, but <clears throat> I think Rishi Sunak perhaps is being saturated in a slightly different way, which is he said as Chancellor that he was going to increase spending on um, social care and on the National Health Service, in particular the National Health Service, and that it would have to be paid for, uh, that there wasn't a magic money tree. Well, of course, there has been a magic money tree, but the, the mani magic money tree has come to an end. That's his position. And for his credibility as Chancellor, it would be very bad, I think, if now it could be said, oh, yes, well, all these increases can be... Uh, can be uh, paid for uh, and the taxpayer doesn't need to bother to uh, recompense the exchequer, it can all go on borrowing. Now Margaret Thatcher was a bit of a stickler for trying to reduce um, public borrowing and uh, Rishi therefore is showing some Thatcherite tendencies in wishing to control uh, the amount of public borrowing. Now 
I want to talk about the point you made earlier, which is ultimately one thing that's keeping Boris Johnson safe right now is if we think about who could replace him, no one's really sticking the head above the pad that you had Tom Tugendhat um, saying he will run if there's a vacancy, um, but no one in cabinet. And you uh, mounted your own challenge for the leadership of the party in 2001. What do you think will be going through the minds of, um, you know, would-be contenders? You mentioned Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss when it comes to when to make your move, how to operate, where, why by perhaps you look loyal while also keeping your uh, chances there? Well, I think they'll be wondering whether there is any dignified way to indicate to the world that you'd be willing to lead the Conservative Party, whilst also telling the world that you're absolutely loyal to the existing Prime Minister. Uh, and the fact is that there is, there is no dignified way of doing that. Uh, I think Rishi Sunak uh, made a pretty good error right at the beginning of this when he was very slow to indicate uh, support for uh, the Prime Minister and did so in a pretty half-hearted way. On that first day, Liz Truss was pretty slow, but she's since become uh, apparently a very fulsome supporter of uh, Boris Johnson as leader of the Conservative Party. No, they, they are in a bind. Um, Tom Tugendhat is in a much easier position. He can declare his hand. He has declared his hand. The, the thing that um, Tom Tugendhat would have to fear, because I've made both of these mistakes. So <laughs> one mistake I made was being in the cabinet and trying to indicate to people that if John Major left, I would be ready to stand. But the following time, which was 2001, the one you referred to, um, I declared my candidacy very early because I didn't want a reputation for hesitancy. And then for a couple of weeks, maybe I'm exaggerating, but there were no other candidates. And I was hanging there, the only target. So in all that time, all the fire was directed at me. So Tom is somewhat in that position. Uh, being a declared prospective candidate, uh, he does offer himself as a target for criticism and for, indeed, character assassination, because things get pretty nasty in the Tory party. And on that, I mean, the Tory party does have a reputation for being regicidal, but some have been querying that recently and asking whether the Tory party has lost its appetite. Uh, what do you think? Well, I don't think the Tory party actually has an appetite for regicide. It's just that, you know, every now and again, it deems it um, necessary. I mean, obviously, I wasn't in agreement when they deemed it necessary in the case of Margaret Thatcher. Uh, when they deemed it necessary in the case of Theresa May, I thought it was massively overdue. Um, but uh, the decision, I think I may have said this already, is not, of course, just whether you want Boris Johnson or not, but whether you think that someone else would do better. I think it's a very tricky decision because th things look pretty bad at the moment. It's difficult to imagine with the anger that people feel about Partygate that they'll have forgotten it in three years' time. But three years' time is a very, very long time. I think it is quite possible that at least they won't feel the rage that they feel now. Well, maybe, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll have turned against Boris and they won't turn back. But you can't rule anything out because when the electors go to the polls, presumably the choice is going to be uh, Boris Johnson or Keir Starmer. And I think the chances of Boris beating Keir Starmer are still pretty good. So these are complex calculations that Conservative members of Parliament uh, have to make. Uh, maybe Boris's greatest fear should be the following, that quite a lot of members of Parliament don't have much experience, not only because they came in in 2019, but they've not been in a collegiate situation for most of that time because of COVID. So they're, they're quite, they're quite uh, raw, they're quite immature. I mean, for example, I hear people talking about how bad the local election results are going to be and how terrifying that is. But it isn't, because the local election results are normally terrible for the government. And very often governments have done extremely well afterwards. I, I, I remember meeting Boris Johnson to interview him the day after the European elections of, oh my goodness, what was it, 20, 2019, wasn't it? When um, the Conservatives had come fifth and got 9%. But later that year, six months later, would win a general election with a majority of 80. So, you know, the electorate make decisions about how to vote and understand perfectly well. They know that a local election is quite different from a general election, and they may well vote very differently. I, I think, on the other hand, if I've seen the, the, the latest polls, which put uh, Labour five points ahead, I mean, five points ahead is, is historically 
quite a small margin for the opposition party when the government has been through a rough patch, which it certainly has. And do you think in order for Boris Johnson to keep support of those MPs who have decided to stick with him for the time being, does he need to change how he governs? Because one of the big frustrations is the fact that Nemeth Hen often seems very dysfunctional and that leads to bad choices and U-turns. Well, of course he ought to change the way he governs. I mean, I, I think the shambles at Downing Street is absolutely disgraceful and, uh, and unrecognisable from anything I've ever seen um, in the past. So, of course, he ought to govern better and he ought to reorganise. Uh, he ought to become more serious as a person. He ought to become more interested in understanding the decisions that he takes. And not, for example, in the case of Partygate, thinking that because he didn't much like the decision that he had announced, that probably one way of showing his, his contempt for his own announcement was to ignore the rules that he was imposing on others. So, of course, there ought to be improvements. But when I heard him say in the House of Commons, uh, I've got it and I'll fix it, that to me was wholly incredible, and I think will be to the vast majority of Conservatives. So of course he ought to change, but I very much doubt whether any of them is placing a bet on the likelihood that he will change. And just finally, um, Michael Gove is your biographer. He wrote that you were the future of the right, and I think in turn uh, you once said that he was the future of the right. Um, do you still think that? Uh, I doubt it. I mean, it, no, no one's talking about Michael Gove at the moment as a future leader, which, of course, might turn out to be to his advantage. What, what I do know about Michael Gove is that he is, um, in many ways, an absolutely model minister. Uh, you know, he, he stands out uh, head and shoulders above most of his colleagues because when he gets to a department, he has an idea about what he wants to do and he gets it done. Um, so, you know, I think he's a very, very strong candidate for Prime Minister. Uh, unfortunately, he's made many enemies uh, along the way, and so I don't anticipate that that will be what will happen. But in terms of ability, uh, Michael uh, probably would be um, the strongest candidate. Uh, remember, that's not all that Tory MP is worried about. They're, they're also worried about who can win elections. So Boris's inability to be certainly a conventional, I would even say an effective Prime Minister, is, for some members of Parliament at least, secondary to his proven ability to win one election after another. If he can keep his ratings uh, going the right direction, or I suppose turn those ratings around. Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Michael. Mm -hmm.